and perfect things come from God. Amen. Often when I speak to people, they tell me, Ahmed, you believe in God so strongly because when you were growing up, you had nothing. Mm. And so you ought to believe in God, who will give you hope in something. And I go, thank God, that in my poverty, I could believe in Him. Amen. I'm going to read from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7 and the verse 12. Just hear me. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem, and he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has brought us, or has helped us. And the context of this passage was when Israel, a small nation chosen by God, was facing a big enemy, the Philistines, or the Palestinians. The Philistines and a very strong army and they were encircled like Malta was encircled in the 1500s and the people prayed to God and they went to the prophet Samuel and they said Samuel we are weak we are facing a very strong enemy could you cry to the Lord could you ask the Lord our God and he will give us victory our victory is in Him. We have no weapons. We have nothing. But we have Him. And if we have Him, we, we will have victory. Because He brought us to this land. He promised us to give us this land. And truly, Samuel called the fast. And the Israel, the people of Israel prayed. And they had victory. And so Samuel writes this memorial stone and he calls it Ebenezer. It is this far that the Lord has brought us. And for me, this is meaningful for me today because my life has been a journey. Today, there's none of my parents who are here and that shows you that I come from a very humble beginning. I was raised as a Muslim. My father was an Imam. And I was raised in this strong Muslim faith until in the secondary school, I, when I, I can remember when I was young, I was always you know, in the mosque hoping that one day I'd become like an imam like my father. And in secondary school, just before I wrote my own levels, you know, I, we had this challenge. I, I was going to go to Saudi Arabia after my own levels to study Islamic law in Jeddah. And my father was very proud of me. And, but that same year, just before we finished, I went to a Christian meeting. I was invited to a Christian meeting in the secondary school called the Scripture Union. And I went there and there were these people who were raising their hands up. And they were singing like we were doing this morning. And I'm going, who are these nuts people? Who, who, who are these people who have no respect for God? And they're raising their hands. I was told that God is the person whom you approach really quietly and you know you have to speak to him like he is somewhere far away and he's going to strike you if you do something wrong and it was disrespectful for me to find people calling God their father I had never been taught as a Muslim I believe that if you do good and your good outweighs your bad then you go to heaven if your bad outweighs your good then you go to hell and this is what I was taught, so I have to earn God's favor in my, in my life. So, but when I went to this meeting, um, they were praying and they were singing and shouting and, you know, calling Jesus his healer. And at the end of this, this meeting, a, a lady, a sport again, you know, in my class, the one who had invited me, wanted to give a testimony of how God, how Jesus had healed her. Now, I had never heard it before. I know God can heal, but I've never experienced something. And I used to be a stammerer. I couldn't, I couldn't speak a statement, two sentences, without actually with difficulty. And so I said, okay, I will, I will try it. I will test these Christians to say if it's true or not. If Jesus can make me speak well, I will become a Christian. So I made a promise. And I told Kezia, you pray for me. 
if your Jesus heals me and I can speak really well, then I then I give my life to your Jesus. And I'll stop being a Muslim. And you know what? Christians like to jump on such things. And they put hands on me and they pray for me. This was just before we finished our O levels. Three days after, a friend of mine told me, You don't speak stammering. And for the first time ever in my life, I had a personal encounter with God. I had a miracle. I can speak as I speak to you. I never spoke like this before. It was something that I was not used to. I was taught as a child. You cannot compare God to anyone. God has no son. Even Jesus is not God's son. The, the biggest sin that one can commit in Islam is so that God is compared to someone else. Here am I, the son of an imam, having to say that I have a miracle because Jesus healed me. And believe me, it was not easy because I knew that the moment I say that I have a miracle because I went to a church or to a Christian meeting, I would believe in hope. And that's exactly what happened to me. Long story. But I had to leave home just when I finished my O-levels. My father could not speak to me. In fact, my father told me, he said to me, he was so angry, he was so upset with me, that he said to me, if you die, you die like a vulture. The pigs will eat your body. And for my father to say that to me, it was very helpful. I am the youngest of nine kids. And I served my father as an imam from the youngest age. And to depart, my mother and I were very close because I'm, we have we nine and I was the youngest. So I, I was very close to her. And you know, and to leave home, I left home. I remember I carried, you know, I was in boarding school, I carried my trunk and I went home and I put the trunk down. And my father and seven elders, they put me in the middle and they gave me a choice. You either choose us or you choose the Christians. And before I could speak, my father told me, get out of my house. I don't even want to hear anything about you anymore. One of the most painful experiences in my life, but one of the most blessings in my life. Because that is when my journey started with God. And God has been faithful to me. Very, very faithful. I went to every church because for me as a Muslim becoming a Christian, I did not know the barriers of denominations. So you are, either you are Catholic or Protestant or this. And I've kept that. I have kept that because Jesus is the God of all. Amen. There are no divisions with Christ. He has come to die to save us from our sins. And he has one church. He said, I will build my church and the, and the gates of hell will not be there again said. So when I, like Samuel, remember how far I have come, I can say, Ebenezer, this is how far God has brought me. I never dreamed that I would come to Malta, ever. Did not even hear the name Malta until I met the ICP in Ghana. I, I don't even know how we met. But there was this connection with us because I was seeking to serve God. I was seeking that I can use anything, my talents, whatever I can do. So as I became a Christian, I was always involved in the church. And then I came to Malta and had a school of evangelization with ICPE, got trained, met my wife, and it was a blessing. Last week, we were 17 years married. God has been good to me. He has been wonderful to me. I cannot thank him enough. And then when we were, were in Malta, I went to the University of Malta and had, a, had my first degree in accounting and worked as an accountant. But I wanted to serve God. I remember I was going to work in Halfar and I was driving. I had just bought a new car. Um, 
a Citroen in 1994 when I just had Ryumi, my first daughter, proud father. And I was going to work and I was praying in my car. In my car, I always put pray, play worship songs. And maybe a voice spoke to me, let me say it that way, in my heart. Ahmed, I did not bring you to Malta to come and make money. I brought you here for a purpose. And so I went and I prayed and I told my company, I'm going to resign and go to Bible school and go to ministry. So I, my wife and I left Malta in 1995, 96, and we went to Brussels where I studied theology for five years. And we were on our way to Sweden when a pastor of this church, a missionary, called me and said, Ahmed, I'm going to go to America for one year. Could you come to Malta and come and cover up for me? And I will, after one year, I will come and I'll take you. And I'll take you over and you can go to Sweden. My wife was pregnant with our son. So we came here in July, he was born in October. So we said, okay, my mother-in-law had cancer. And we said, it's a good time to come and be with her and just stay with her so that she can enjoy the grandkids whilst we prepare to go to Sweden. When we came to this country, back to Malta, this missionary went to a mod, to America, and he never came back. <laughs> and I was left with this church with no leadership. And as I wanted to leave Malta and go back to Sweden, again, a voice spoke to me. Now this church was so small, they could not even afford a salary. They've never paid me a salary before. In Sweden, I was going to a big church where I was teaching in a Bible school. And my major was in Christian education and Greek and Hebrew and, and a radio station. So I was having a salary, a house, already prepared for me and my kids. But then I came here and the church could not pay me. And you know what? I said, I will not be able to leave these people in this church without a leader and leave to Sweden. I know God will provide for me and my family. And we stayed here. Some of you know, know the story. And 10 years this year I was. Never dreamt of migrants ever coming to Malta. Never dreamt of African people coming here. Until one day, two Congolese people walked to this church in a Sunday service and they said to me, Pastor, we need a place to pray. There are many people in detention. Can you go to us? Huh? Africans in Malta? I thought I was the only one. In 2003. So, so as a church, we began to go to, to, to detention and open centers. And that was when I met Alex and other people from Germany came, churches. So, you know, we played guitar and then we met Jimmy who was singing this morning. And then we give, you know, blankets or food and, and, and help. And one day we were praying here again and I hear another voice. Because many of the questions that most of the African migrants had were legal in nature. And I had no legal experience, I had no background in the law. And one day I was praying and the same voice told me, go to law school. A pastor going to law school? I've never had a combination before. We thought pastors were lawyers were liars. <laughs> How can you as a pastor be a liar? And I prayed and I said, God, if you want me to go, make the way. But I had no Maltese. And to make to go to law school you need A-level bodies. But guess what? I was at a conference on migration at the Felicia. And we were in a focus group. And afterwards, I met the, I met the dean of the faculty of law. And he said to me, Ahmed, did you ever think of studying law? And I go, 
when I was thinking about it, but, but I have no Maltese. And he said to me, you know what, this year, we don't need Maltese A-levels anymore. If you have English, then you can apply, because it's your language. And I go, yes. <laughs> so 2005, I enrolled in the law school, not knowing what would happen. And today, I can stand here, and I can thank God for the journey he has brought in thus far. People have said to me, Ahmed, so what? Now that you have doctor of laws and a lawyer, what will you do? Will you be making money or going to court? And my answer is no. I don't want to be a litigation lawyer. I went to law school because I wanted to use my profession as a lawyer within my work as a pastor. I want to be able to give counsel to people to make the right decisions. I want to be able to support a community of foreigners or third country nationals who are living in this country who sometimes have no confidence or the lack of confidence to go to other movies. So for short, this is my story today. And I want to thank you for coming to share it with me. And I need you to pray with me. And my work in migration will continue and I hope to put my mind in research deeper and deeper. But always within the context of serving God. And Thank you again, that I can say, as Samuel said, I'll finish with this, Samuel reminded the Israelites, and he said to them, this is how far the Lord has brought us. In three ways, he is saying, number one, you have reached this far because of God's grace. You did not do it in your own strength. You didn't do it in your own intellect intelligence or in your own power. It was because of God's grace. And so I want to tell you, we get where we get because of God's grace. His grace is sufficient for us. Amen? That's what Apostle Paul says. My Lord, His grace is sufficient for me. Secondly, I think the Prophet Samuel said so as a reminder that the people of Israel will give thanks to God. You know, sometimes it's very easy that when you succeed, the first thing you do is to turn against God and to pretend that it is because of your own strength and intelligence that you are where you are. I have met people like that who believe because they have nothing. But when they had everything, they said, but who is God in my life? He becomes a history. He becomes an intellectual person in your life. So Samuel is reminding Israelites, know where you came from and continually thank Him. Do not let your head get big. And people have already tried to call me doctor and my head is getting bigger. And I have to remind myself and say, Ahmed, remember, you are Ahmed. Not more than that. It is good to be honored because I've achieved something, but I'm always Ahmed. Sometimes when I go to my office and people come and I'm so busy, and I tell them, I don't have time to talk to you. People tell me, Ahmed, no, you have no time to talk to us. You used to have time to talk to us. And I go, my role has changed, I'm sorry. But I don't have time to talk to everybody at the same time. That's not because my head is becoming big. But once you start getting big at it, then you start saying, wow, huh? Start having a car. Start having people respect you. This morning I have someone tell me, good morning, sir. And I go, well, who is that, sir? I want to remember. But I've come this far because of him. And I can thank you. Lastly, I think that Samuel told Israel this to continue to have hope. 
in their God. If he was able to bring you this far, he's able to complete and take you further. There are most of you here who today is your hope. But if God has brought you far, this far, he will take you to where he has planned to take you. Because your life is in his hands. As we sang this morning, he has the whole world in his hands. The world thinks that they can do it on their own. But look, he took Greece to put the to put the eel on his knees. Can we imagine Greece and Italy and Spain going bankrupt in a week? But sometimes these things make us realize that there is God who everything in his hands. So there is hope. Huh? For those of you who think that by going to Germany, by going to Spain, or going to Europe, there is hope. Hope is not in Germany. Hope is in God. Amen? Amen. And that's what Samuel is telling them. If God could bring you this far, then he will take you that far. So whether it's in your family, whether it is in your work, difficult times might come. Ebenezer. So let this be a, a daily thing. That when you wake up in the morning, you will say, God, Ebenezer. I like that song. And I'm going to sing with my voice. Please forgive me. But Africans sing in everything they do. And they dance. We saw me dancing this morning. Ebenezer. Yame.